Welcome all of you here tonight to our graduate center, those of you in the room and those of you watching, wherever you may be on uh, PGC TV. For those of you who are watching uh, and wish to participate in the question and answer period that follows the talks, you can tweet in your remarks, hashtag BarGradCenterTV, and we will pick up uh, your questions off of our Twitter feed. Tonight's event is part of the public-facing side of uh, a project at the Bard Graduate Center, Cultures of Conservation, funded generously by the Andrew uh, W. Mellon Foundation, which is designed to bring together conser conservators and conservation knowledge with humanists from across the different disciplines to enrich the conversation and study of material culture. And tonight's event, in particular, is interesting because it is, uh, to some extent, a report on a project that was undertaken within or under the auspices of the larger cultures of conservation rubric. Uh, the two speakers tonight were a team <coughs> that presented itself uh, in competition for the first round of postdoctoral fellowships that were awarded by Cultures of Conservation. Gabrielle Brillinger came to the Bard Graduate Center as a fellow, and she returns this evening as an assistant professor from the University of North Carolina. Her partner this evening from the podium was, uh, David Favolaro is, in fact, uh, but was at the time uh, the partner with whom she worked on the project for which she applied, which had to do with study of not an object to be conserved, but a building and, in fact, an institution. David Favolaro is the director of curatorial affairs at the Lower East Side Tenement Museum. And together, the two of them worked on studying conservation questions relating to the specific nature of the Lower East Side Tenement Museum. Now, Gabrielle Berlinger now is assistant professor of American Studies and Folklore and Tannenbaum Fellow of American Jewish Studies at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. PhD and MA from Indiana University in Bloomington in the Department of Folklore and Ethnomusicology. Uh, David Favolaro has been in charge of interpreting the buildings at 97 and 103 Orchard Street that comprise the Lower East Side Tenant Museum, and he has an MA in public history from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. So tonight, uh, our format will be as follows. Professor Berlinger will speak first from the podium, then uh, David Favolaro will come up here and comment on that speech, and then the two of them and myself will retire, as it were, to the table and begin a conversation which we hope will draw all of you in immediately into some of the questions, theoretical and practical, raised by this collaboration between a scholar who is a folklorist and a scholar who is in charge of running the House Museum. So it's my pleasure to invite to the podium uh, Gabriel Berlinger, who for <coughs> the last two years was uh, was based here and now returns uh, to comment on the work uh, from afar. Please. Good evening, and thank you so much to Dean Peter Miller and the entire faculty and administration here at the Bard Graduate Center. I am so pleased to be back and to reflect on this project together with you and also uh, continue the conversation about cultures of conservation, which was such an enlightening period for me here. Thank you also to Dave Pavlora for coming to join this conversation. It was really a meaningful collaboration for me for the past two years. So, oh, I guess I, am I in charge of bringing up my, uh, oh, just, if you hit the next button. Oh, great. Thank you. So who here, before I begin a show of hands, who's been to the Tenement Museum? Lori said, yeah, I expected it. That's great. Um, so we'll have a rich discussion. Um, in February 2014, I sat down with founder and former president of the Lower East Side Tenement Museum, Ruth Abram, to hear her thoughts on the history and ongoing process of preservation at the museum. The Lower East Side Tenement Museum in downtown Manhattan, as you all know, is a five-story wood brick framed uh, tenement apartment building constructed in the 1860s. Although the lot was originally intended for a single residence, single building, uh, the tenement housed, housed over 7,000 immigrants in 20 apartments until 1935 when the doors were sealed shut due to the building code violations that its landlord refused to correct. Today, this building is a museum that interprets the lives of the former immigrant residents 
through preservation and tours of their former apartment spaces. About the museum's process, Abrams said, quote, I think of the museum as a set design. So yes, I think you can replace it all. We'd have to close the museum, but if I didn't think we were approximating the experience and the feeling, if I didn't think we were approximating the experience and the feeling. But I think the most important thing in terms of authenticity is that the museum is telling actual stories of people who actually lived in the building. Some very erudite preservationists may find this a very distressing philosophy, but most people want and deserve and need the story. And if we can tell it in an interesting, an intriguing and exciting way, in an atmosphere that approximate was what it was and always only approximates, I think that's fair enough, as long as we're honest and we make it clear. And as you know, we're only approximating it now. I mean, we've made mistakes in the Gumpert's apartment, for example. You know, we put up the wrong wallpaper. And my philosophy was to tell the people that we made a mistake, but not necessarily replace it. I think that none of these apartments look the way they looked. If you made the Levine apartment look as it looked, there'd be scraps of paper and fabric everywhere. There'd hardly be a place to move. It would be full of dust, and there'd be babies crying, and people bustling around, and you wouldn't be able to let people in. They couldn't move there. So we've made accommodations left and right in order to bring people into the story. I don't think there's anything to excuse about that." End quote. How do we measure the success of an historic house museum? By the degree to which the historic structure is physically preserved? By the number of people who visit each year? By the sense of authenticity that the visitor experiences? By the breadth of information imparted by the building's history? All of these factors conservation achievements, public at attendance, affective impact, and educational value are implicated in the quest to understand an historic house museum's success, which begs the question, what is the purpose of this museum? This presentation explores the relationship between the historic preservation of this 150-year-old tenement building turned museum and the goals of the curators, conservators, historic preservation architects, and educators who have created and continue to recreate the museum experience within. One year before that conversation, I applied for a postdoctoral fellowship here at the Bard Graduate Center to investigate the practice and philosophy behind the ongoing preservation work at the Lower East Side Tenement Museum. Attracted by the Bard Graduate Center's Cultures of Conservation initiative that aims to connect the perspective of conservation to an interdisciplinary notion of the human sciences, I proposed to approach this historic tenement building, <coughs> now turned museum, as a cons conserved object, the building as the museum's primary artifact, in constant use and under continual care. In the life of this object, who decides how to preserve it and why? As fate would have it, one year prior to my application, the Lower East Side Tenement Museum had received funding from the Institute of Museum and Library <coughs> Services to convene a preservation action com committee a select group of interdisciplinary preservation and conservation experts, including architectural historians, structural engineers, conservators, climate control specialists, historic preservation architects, museum curators, and educators, to assess the building's current state and draft a preservation action plan. The 10 members of this committee would meet biannually between 2012 and 2015 and share their findings to craft a strategy that would stabilize the building with a 15-year plan. The coincidental timing of the museum's self-study with my research project allowed me to access the variety of perspectives at play and many hands at work in the preservation of the building. As I sat at the table with the Preservation Action Committee, I listened to a multiplicity of voices dedicated to enabling the tenement museum's future. My project investigates these conflicts and compromises that arose and continue to exist in preserving the building, a museum that must constantly renegotiate competing demands. First, the museum's primary commitment to telling its former residents' histories through an immersive visitor experience. Second, the dependence of 70% of the museum's budget on visit visitor ticket sales on the 362 days it is open each year. And third, the accelerating deterioration of the historic structure, the main artifact, due to the museum's rising visitorship. The Tenement Museum building is an artifact that is continually touched, retouched, and repaired in order to serve the public. The most fundamental philosophical question is whether certain features, physical features, of this structure must remain original in order to serve the museum's mission, or whether the entire building could be gradually reconstructed over time. How much physical intervention would endanger the authenticity of this historic site? Is there a point in the ongoing preservation process at which the visitor experience will be irreversibly compromised? 
Beyond these questions, as a folklorist interested more generally in vernacular architecture, and this refers to common structures and everyday landscapes, I approach 97 Orchard Street as a material expression of the social histories and values of its immigrant builders and users, and today, of its current visitors and caretakers as well. Its ongoing conservation is essentially connected to the preservation of the human experiences and stories with which the building was imbued throughout its use. Folklorist Joseph Shiura argues for an ethnographic approach to the study of vernacular architecture, specifically to integrate the spoken word into the study of popular buildings, allowing a deeper insight into the meaning of the objects. He observed that, quote, what people say about the houses in which they live, the spaces in which they work, and the buildings where they worship offers a rich source of documentation on the social and symbolic use of vernacular architecture. Between 2013 and 2015, I learned about the ongoing restoration projects at 97 Orchard. These included vibration monitoring, conservation of linoleum, linoleum flooring and wallpaper, ceiling plaster conservation, and refinishing of the, of the building's facade. I attended preservation action committee meetings at which these various stakeholders mentioned above uh, assessed the current state of the structure and debated how to resolve their competing aims and devise preservation strategies to move forward. And here's the photo just of the, really some of the committee meeting sessions at the museum. And here walking through um, after kind of morning sessions of presentation and reports there would be often um, tours throughout the building to, to address specific on-site issues through, uh, through physical examination. And then specifically this first project in the first year of my, of my research project was the ceiling plaster issue. Um, pieces of the ceiling had been falling down, they were critical, and Dave can definitely explain more um, background, detailed background about, about what the process entailed, but there was a very specific um, experimental um, glue that was used in order to adhere um, all the plaster pieces back in place, but they had to make this decision about whether to go in through the, um, the ceiling. You can see they could, they could have gone in the top right there and worked on it from below, or they could go to the apartment above and lift up the floor and work on the ceiling from above. And they chose to do the, the ladder, and this is the, the upstairs apartment down here. They had removed the floorboards and uh, treat it from above. This is the linoleum cover that had been over the uh, floor, and they had rolled it up through, again, another amazingly meticulous and experimental process to peel off that, that linoleum after it had been in place for so long. So uh, this was also a scaffold that you see in the top space there. And then this, um, the top two photos there are a little dark, but they are from when the class I taught here went to the Tenement Museum, and we got to walk on the scaffolding and look at the micro jacks and, and talk with the conservator, Mary Jablonski, who was there um, about the process. And down here was in the second year, the refinishing of the facade. Uh, Michael Groves, who has worked on the building since its start, he was leading this team to repaint and restore, and then also down here to show us how he created the proper wood grain um, to match the right time. In, all of, in both of those cases, there were a lot of conversations about how to, how to uh, move forward in these projects that weighed various options between um, interpretation and physical conservation, and we can uh, speak with Dave about that more soon. I also interviewed, in addition to these uh, meetings, members of the staff and the committee to gather perspectives on how to preserve the structure's historic fabric, yet achieve the museum's interpretive goals. Valuing each specialist's expertise and commitment to the, historic, historic, the museum's historic material and activist mission, I sought the points of convergence and divergence in their perspectives regarding the historic preservation located within the museum experience. This study is also a contemporary example of the effort to balance conservation and interpretation in historic houses and living history museums more broadly. So back to the museum. The Tenement Museum stands unassumingly at 97 Orchard Street in the center of Manhattan's ever more gentrifying Lower East Side. Constructed between 1863 and 1864, before housing laws had been introduced in New York City, the building is flanked by similar tenements on either side that share its Italianate style facade, a typical style of the period. 
Orchard Street's architectural character reaches back to the late 19th and early 20th century when immigration to this area of the lower of Lower Manhattan was exploding in an overpopulated community for German, Irish, Italian, and Eastern European Jewish immigrants seeking a new home and life. By 1910, the neighborhood's population had reached its dense peak density at 550,000 people, the most crowded blocks, including Orchard Street, numbering about 2,200 residents each. 97 Orchard Street, at the, a building at the center of this teeming area, housed 20 immigrant families, four apartments on each of the five buildings, the building's five floors, on a lot, as I said, intended for a single family residence. Each apartment measured 325 square feet, and consisted of three rooms, a parlor, a kitchen, and a bedroom. Two commercial spaces in the basement of the building were in continual use throughout its history. Originally built without indoor plumbing or gas and with only one room in each apartment exposed to direct sunlight, uh, the tenement housed, as I said, nearly 7,000 immigrants in the 72 years between its opening in 64 and closing in 1935, when the landlord refused to bring the, house, the building up to code. In 1988, half a century after the doors had been sealed, two social activists, Ruth Abram, whom I mentioned, and Anita Jacobson, discovered the building. Though the structure was in a state of physical disrepair, they recognized the interior, untouched since 1935, as an urban time capsule. You can see it's boarded up on the left when they found it. Immediately, they envisioned how the neglected layers of the building's historic fabric could narrate these social histories and cultural experiences of the immigrants who occupied its space. They catalyzed the building's rehabilitation and development of what would become the Tenement Museum, the only tenement building in New York whose interior was still intact. The Lower East Side Tenement Museum's preservation philosophy noted that, quote, 70 uh, 97 Orchard Street is a remarkable survivor of the early period of tenement house construction, revealing 72 years of urban family life, early tenement construction, housing reform, and interior decoration. This unique building tells the economic, social history, cultural, and personal histories of working class immigrants from 20th, 19th and 20th century New York as no other site or structure can, through the material evidence and individual experiences of the people who actually lived, worked in, adapted, and decorated these spaces as expressions of their lives. Today, the museum has opened seven spaces for public touring, six recreated apartments, Confino, Gumpert's, Baldizi, Levine, Rogoshevsky, and more, and one commercial space, the saloon, now in the basement floor. Each one restored to a particular historic moment in the lives of the actual families who lived and used, in the, lived and used those spaces. And these are some dark, darker photos of, um, there were some restored apartments, furnished both with recreated, um, multi, you know, expressing here multiple strategies of preservation, again, a really unique feature. So there's pieces of these spaces that are restored, that are preserved, that are recreated. A lot of these objects have been purchased anew um, at antique fairs and, and um, estate sales. Um, they're all contemporary with the period of the, the apartment, but they were not found on site. The museum relies on oral history and archival research, as well as architectural and archaeological investigation of the building spaces for its preservation and interpretation. Since its opening, the museum's popularity has soared, and currently over 200,000 people visit per year. In April 2014, it reached its peak visitorship for a single day when 1,000 people toured the structure between 10 a.m. and 5 p.m., climbing and descending its five-floor wooden staircase, walking beneath its cracked plaster ceilings, along the sloped floorboards, and through its narrow, hollow, narrow hallways covered with up to 20 <coughs> layers of chipped paint and peeling wallpaper. And these are some of the um, apartments that are in what they call a stabilized ruin state. So you can enter them, and there are tours of these spaces as well. Um, they are, they're just not refurnished and, and interpreted um, to the specific moment of the resident. In 2006, the museum created a conservation management plan that outlined strategies for physical in intervention after deterioration in the structure had been identified. And this was with the increasing, constantly increasing visitorship. In the introduction to this conservation management plan, a physical assessment of the building and a philosophical inquiry into its preservation mission acknowledges a conflict. Quote, heritage sites such as 97 Orchard Street simultaneously need to be both presented to and protected from the public. Seven years later, 
in 2013 during a preservation action committee held in the museum to plan the new, the new strategy moving forward, two contracted structural engineers presented the results of months of vibration monitoring in the building. The cause of recently falling pieces of plaster ceiling in the upper floors, they concluded, was clear. Quote, we've completely confirmed that it's the people. <laughs> the Preservation Action Committee was charged with protecting the building for the very people who were compromising it. This example epitomizes the museum's ongoing dilemma, how to reconcile the needs and goals of its tangible and intangible heritages. As both our artifact and tool of education, 97 Orchard Street preserves and reconstructs both these tangible and intangible heritages of its occupants. As anthropologist Seth Lowe has commented, quote, cultural conservation is inseparable from conservation of place. The disruption of place limits people's ability to reproduce their social world and everyday lives. The tangible and intangible are tightly interwoven. However, tensions do exist within that fabric. In the Tenement Museum's preservation philosophy, historic preservation architect and member of the Preservation Ac uh, Action Committee, Judith Salzman, wrote, quote, the preservation of 97 Orchard Street is predicated on retaining the palpable sense of history contained within its walls and of providing both the experience of the tenement as people lived there and as it was found. To do so, it's critical to identify appropriate ways of treating the building's historic fabric. The philosophy for the treatment of 97 Orchard is based on several key goals. One, to provide safe public access to the historic resource. Two, to respect all contributions of the periods of, of the site's historic significance, 1863 to 1935. Three, to maximize the retention of the site's historic character. Four, to minimize the loss of extant historic fabric. And five, to integrate historic preservation with the interpretive program. As the historic fabric continues to degrade with the museum's success, however, the balance of material preservation, historic character, and public safety is an ever-evolving negotiation. How is the Tenement's mission, Tenement Museum's mission, which is to preserve and interpret the history of immigration through the personal experiences of the generations of newcomers who settled in and built lives on Manhattan's Lower East Side, influenced by the changing state of its primary artifact, a slowly disintegrating building? Oh, we'll come back. Um, after the first apartment was opened to the public, a series of formal recognitions of the site's uh, historic and cultural value ensued. In 1992, the building was listed on the National Register of Historic Places. In 94, it was designated a National Historic Landmark. In 98, it was named a Lower East Side Tenement National Historic Site and an affiliated area of the National Park System. And in 2001, it was listed as a con contributing building within the National Register, Register's Lower East Side Historic District. The museum gradually expanded its exhibition space and public outreach. Between 2002 and 2006, the aforementioned um, conservation management plan was produced. And this is um, the plan right here on the table <laughs> with Judith Salzman, who helped uh, write that plan, also a current member of the Preservation Action Committee. It included chapters um, labeled preservation philosophy, uh, visitor impact and capacity analysis, architectural cyclical maintenance plan, housekeeping plan, and more. And they probed the issue of authenticity by considering the appropriate levels of restoration needed to maintain, as we said, both the museum's structural integrity and the integrity of the educational mission. Regarding the temperature and, and relative humidity in the building, for example, the document queried, <coughs> how much climate control is really necessary for the Lower East Side Tenement Museum? The public spaces, spaces in the building should not have more than the minimum heat for visitor comfort. Anything more will be a distortion of the message. And this is in capital letters. This is the way things were. Full environmental controls will make the experience feel quite inauthentic. A later passage states, the cramped hallways, dark rooms, and limited ventilation are critical to the visitor's understanding of tenement life, ensuring that the experience is authentic, that there are public safety measures in place, and that visitors do not ultimately destroy the historic fabric of the tenement remain the ongoing challenges. Nearly a decade later, several themes emerged in my discussions with museum and committee participants about the museum's preservation process that echoed the rhetoric of this document. The authenticity of the historic fabric, the authenticity of the visitor experience, and the roles of memory and nostalgia were among key concepts around which individuals position themselves with respect to the degree of restoration necessary. Bridging all distinct perspectives, however, I recognize the shared affective 
experience of the structure. The following voices express both sensory and emotional relationships that define their divergent visions for the preservation of the physical structure. For preservation architect Judith Salzman, who has been working since the opening, working on the building since its opening, sensory interaction with the building is essential. The building's feature that she considers most vital for preservation is the mahogany banister installed in 1863 uh, in Cuba. There's a quote, there's a difference between something that all the people have touched, something that's been created, and something that's been created to look like it. Their DNA is part of that material. It's the intangible aspect of it. By contrast, she then described a friend's reaction to Ellis Island's cleaned and preserved main building. Quote, there's no smell in there, she recalled her friend exclaiming. For Salzman, in addition to physical touch, the smell of the air, the level of illumination, and the level of illumination are critical to evoking a holistic experience of the past. The mahogany banister, a locus of shared touch, embodies the quote, palpable sense of history that Salzman said she would hope could be preserved into the future. Pamela Keach, consulting furnishing curator, who does a lot of the purchasing for the interior spaces, also located the entryway as a site of great meaning. Um, she said, quote, one of my favorite things is the electric meter bank just past the stairway. And you see it on the upper right, uh, uh, lower right, excuse me. You think about how many tenants lived here and were concerned about electricity use, and that electricity only came in here around 1930, and how much it changed, how much life changed when it did. I also love the mailboxes back there, because they have the apartment numbers on them, and you think about all the people who touched the mailboxes and got their mail every day, and the new tenants who moved in and used them after that. These things are like arboglyphs, carved writing in trees that evolve with the tree's growth, the letters bulging out and changing shape. They're alive. Pamela then broadened her perspective on what must be preserved to include, quote, anything that you know so many people have touched, and especially in light of the fact that the museum allows visitors to continue in that history and still touch it today. When asked how she might define the notion of authenticity in the context of 97 Orchard Street, she replied, when visitors cry, when you see the tears in their eyes. Unlike Ruth Abram, Pamela reads the materiality and the structure of the building as belonging to, quote, someone's home, not a set design grounding her interpretation of authenticity in the present private moment of a domestic encounter rather than a public exhibition of past domestic life. Jason Eisner, education associate, echoed Judith's and Pamela's views, but without focusing on a single material. Quote, I don't think we could ever redo the hallway, he said. It's irreplaceable. The front hallway really appears to some people like a magic portal, like they just suddenly stepped into the past. Sometimes it's extremely emotional for them, and they say, this is my grandpa's floor from the Bronx. In the Arch Architecture of Memory, a Jewish Muslim household in colonial Algeria, 1937 to 1962, anthropologist Joel Balul describes how the several families who lived in a single Algerian house recall their histories through memory of the structure and space, through the architecture. As the former residents narrate memories of their previous lives in Algeria from their new home in France, Balul observes that, quote, the past becomes a strategy for legitimating the present. The house, as it is remembered and described in great material detail, represents a symbolic entrenchment into a human and geographic environment that has vanished. Memory unfolds as a symbolic denial of migration, separation, and cultural strangeness in French society. Balul's insight into this relationship between architecture, memory, and symbolic interpretation resonates with Jason's reflection on the power of the Tenement Museum's hallway, but the circumstance is different. It is compounded by the experiential quality of the museum visit. Individuals remember a place they once knew through the immersive experience of entering its, a physical space, a magic portal. Jason continued, quote, the hallway encapsulates the full chronology of the building, and it does so in a seamless way. You can talk about the Victorian architecture. You can talk about the pragmatic patching up of the ceiling with pressed metal initially applied because it was easier to maintain than plastic, than plaster. And then you can see all the patches that are probably from people moving out and unintentionally smashing a chunk of the tin away. So you can begin in 1864 when the build, building opened and go through the 1890s to the 1901 law to the 1935 closure. And then you can talk about the Tenement Museum today. Look at us, we rebuilt the staircase so we can go learn about the upstairs. You go 150 years in time in an extremely evocative space. It's all time revealed at once. 
Jason recognizes the historic fabric of the hallway as an instrument of time travel, a material prompt to reunite with familiar places long gone. Andrew Dulcar, art architectural historian and Preservation Action Committee member as well, also affirmed the value of the museum's ability to transport visitors to another time through memory and experience or imagination, but he allows for the inevitability of physical alteration. Quote, I'm not a supporter of the postmodern view that everything is worth preserving just because it's here, he said. The Lower East Side Tenement Museum tells the stories of people who live there, and that's what it's all about. The time travel they achieve is brilliant, but some historic fabric must be destroyed to do it. And despite the changes, Dolkart declares, I still feel the presence of generations in there. It's a very moving place. The preservation of the hallway provokes deep emotion through personal memory. However, in that evocation, Jason also perceives a problem. The blurring of historical reality with family lore, and the desire to impose personal narratives on the reality of the social histories told by the museum. Quote, nostalgia is kind of a fantasy lens, he says. People can be nostalgic for a past they didn't really know. Nostalgia doesn't allow for a whole lot of interrogation. So our visitors often come to the museum with family lore created hand in hand with nostalgia and mixed with the History Channel. For example, they come with really powerful <coughs> convictions like when my family came here, they wanted to learn English right away. That was different than today. And that's tricky for an educator, a tour guide educator, to say, you're wrong. Because as soon as you say that, no matter how exciting the hallway is, people stop listening to you. Nobody wants to be told they're wrong. That's the tricky thing about the Tenement Museum. A lot of people are looking for affirmation of these family myths. But because so many people don't remember what Grandpa said, and I'm one of those people, there's this push to learn about it. So I think that's one of the dangers of nostalgia. You have this very rigid visitor who will insist that their way is the way. I think the personal is the most political you can be. And because of this, this may be one of the most political museums out there. In her reflections, Liz, uh, Liz Subchenko, the former vice president of interpretation at the Tenement Museum, also commented on the dynamic between history and memory in the museum's ongoing restoration. Quote, from the beginning, the museum was very responsible about interrogating and owning its different kinds of sources and identifying each of them as a different ingredient being, different ingredient being combined together into a soup that was the ultimate product. This was to make sure that the visitors really understood the different truths that each ingredient spoke. And here you see some of the, um, on their current website, still the list of, of sources they collect. Artifacts, archival documents, photos, oral histories, and here's a photo of one of their archaeological digs on site. <coughs> Despite the ersatz creative, recreated environment, it was completely to the point of being crippling, dedicated to not having composites and having everything be based only on what documentation was actually found. Oral history was a source, but every different truth that the wallpaper or the census record or the oral history spoke was articulated, distinctly interrogated, and explained to visitors. It's a specious distinction between memory and history. It's not a binary. Every, sooth, every source has a different truth." End quote. The truth that each source speaks resonates with the truth that Jason ultimately also identified in nostalgia. There are different <coughs> kinds of nostalgia, he concluded. And they're all realities because they're different, because they're interpretations that are alive in someone's, someone's mechanics. <clears throat> Folklorist Henry Glassy contextualizes this dynamic in the context of historic preservation when he says that, quote, history, has, history to be clear is not the past, most of which has gone without a trace, but a story about the past designed to be useful in the present. And the things called historic, whether wordy documents or mute artifacts, are the materials out of which an idea of the past can be constructed. All buildings are historic, but limited resources force hard choices about preservation. Which buildings hold such symbolic wealth that they must be preserved? In the case of the Tenement Museum, we can restate this question. Which materials hold such symbolic wealth that they must be preserved? The mahogany banister, the curling wallpaper, the falling plaster from the ceiling? The relationship between material preservation, visitor experience, and educator interpretation is one of constant negotiation. I began with the museum's founder, Ruth Abram, and I now close with her. Abram's perspective is clear. The material is secondary to the story. Quote, the most important thing in terms of authenticity, she said, is that the museum is telling actual stories of people who actually lived in the building in an intriguing and exciting way, in an atmosphere that approximates what it was. And indeed, when the museum realized after completing the first recreation in the Gumpert's apartment that it had inaccurately wallpapered the parlor, 
the wallpaper that is up. They left the mistake and incorporated the story into their tour. Transparency is a key pillar of the educational and interpretive approach. Regarding preservation and reconstruction, Abram added, quote, I'm all, for, I'm all for doing as much as possible, but not to the exclusion of letting people in. The idea from the beginning was that we're inviting the American public home to meet their families, and you don't invite people home and have velvet ropes separating them from the place. For Abram, the museum's authenticity is rooted in empathy. Quote, that you stand inside a space and listen to the story of the struggles and triumphs of another human being and realize that they were quite similar to you, facing perhaps to similar circumstances, and find a way to empathize with them and their story. That's authentic. We're not talking about this room and that table and that vase. You can't do that with poor people. They had to be measured by the content of their dreams, not the content of their apartments. Though Abram prioritizes the intangible heritage of the museum, the lived experience of the tenants of 97 Orchard, it's the tangible artifact of the building, the dark hallway, the bank of electric meters frozen in time, the empty mailboxes, that evoke a visitor's sense of connection and empathy. The decisions about the authenticity, preservation, and conservation of the artifact continue to be wrestled with by all those involved. Now, in 2016, the Preservation Action Committee has concluded its service. For the three grant-funded years of its tenure from 2012 to 2015, Members oversaw new strategies of condition monitoring and implemented experimental conservation treatments. The written product of the collaboration, just recently published, is a 1,009-page preservation action plan. Thanks to Dave. Um, edited, compiled, written by Dave. Um, and it reports the assessment findings and recommends interventions in five-year increments to allow for staff to identify and address immediate concerns and hopefully allow for minimal loss of historic fabric. With respect to the museum's preservation philosophy from 2002, a final line in the introduction of this plan asserts that, quote, it is important to understand that all work conducted for the sake of preservation of 97 Orchard Street is undertaken as a way to not only proactively manage change, but also to provide continued exemplary visitor experience. Vigorous dialogue in the committee's final sessions addressed whether to edit the words preservation, conservation, and restoration <coughs> in the museum's current preservation philosophy on the grounds that they may not fully reflect the extent of the work of the museum staff and consultants. Discussing this dilemma, a committee member read aloud the American Institute for Conservation Definitions of Terminology and the Secretary of Interior Standards, all of which had informed the language of the preservation philosophy. Andrew Dolcart then commented that the preservation of the museum does not conform to a quote parochial definition. It is not saving every nut and bolt. The group as a whole concurred that the interpretation of the building to the degree undertaken by the museum staff and consultants is not sufficiently accounted for in current official notions of the aim of preservation. Quote, if this were totally about preservation and conservation, Judith Salzman continued, we wouldn't be having this conversation. The museum would not have the educational impact that it has. This was the first lesson I, lesson I learned in this project. It's the engagement of the visitor. Folklorist Barbara Kirshenblatt Gimlet cites philosopher Stanley Evelyn's concept of a thing as a, quote, slow event to illuminate the inextricable relationship between tangible and intangible forms of heritage. All forms of heritage, tangible and intangible, are modes of cultural production or metacultural per performances, she affirms, in which people self-consciously curate culture. Of significance, her observation is not an attempt to define categories of tangible and intangible heritage, but a focus on individual agency and performance as the loci of meaning, regardless of form. When people engage with things and landscapes around them, they perform and re-perform their histories, values, and circumstances with each engagement. The tangible and intangible are bridged as people activate the material world through unique perceptions and relationships to it. The Tenement Museum exemplifies the bridging of tangible and intangible and the power of such a metacultural process. Walking through the hallways and apartments in 97 Orchard Street, visitors embody the physical and social experiences of the building's former residents, creating and recreating the histories and meanings embedded in the building's material reality. The notion of a material that has the power of presence resonates throughout individuals' impressions of the space and the structure of 97 Orchard. As an artifact that connects people with the former inhabitants of the building or with an earlier period of time, or as a material with its own power of presence created through use and reuse, the historic fabric of the structure has what anthropologist Robert Plant Armstrong called an affecting presence. Recognizing this presence 
is critical in addressing the question that Glassie posed. Which materials hold such symbolic wealth that they must be preserved? In the field of architecture, a similar experience-centered perspective is espoused by Bernard Schumi. Inspired by post-structural movements in the 60s and 70s, Schumi asserted that it's only through the conditions of use that something can be produced. Through ongoing tours and conservation treatments, since the day the museum opened, the preservation and interpretation and use of 97 orchards support one another to continually create the structure. Acknowledging the affective power of the physical structure and the lived experience of the space within, the museum staff and the preservation and conservation specialists reveal in their reflections how 97 Orchard has become a mediator between memory and history, between nostalgia and doubt, individual experience and collective identity, and the past, the present, and the future. I won't have any slides for my um, uh, comment, but uh, I want to thank Gabby for leaving this one uh, up there. So I'll speak to that in just a moment. But I wanted to begin by thanking uh, the Bard Graduate Center and uh, Gabrielle for inviting both the Tenement Museum and myself to participate in this process, uh, the Cultures of Conservation process. I think, uh, as uh, Gabby noted, it was incredibly timely. Uh, we had really just begun, or were at the um, point of, of, of beginning this three uh, plus year project. And so, um, you know, for me as somebody who uh, in some way uh, is trained as a historian, this is kind of uh, this building preservation work uh, some, somewhat new to me. And I think um, I was really interested uh, not only in exploring a lot of these kind of philosophical questions, I think that Gabrielle um, really eloquently summed up in her talk, uh, but really kind of, I think, leaving the museum with a, uh, a record, uh, a legacy of the conversations that took place about all of these, these um, deep and meaningful questions uh, that, that are uh, present in really, I think, all of the both long-term and daily decision-making uh, that takes place with regard to preserving uh, what we think of as, as Gabby said, as our kind of primary artifact uh, at the Tenement Museum, which is, of course, the building in 97 Orchard Street. So. Um, at the very least, that hadn't been done before, and so uh, uh, we, we uh, are very thankful to kind of bequeath that to whoever succeeds us at the Tenement Museum, that there's this incredible record of, uh, of this, this conversation, the series of conversations that took place um, between about 2012 and 2015. Um, and so to kind of begin, I wanted to kind of add to some of what Gabrielle said in, in, in terms of um, you know, kind of the impetus for this project that resulted in this, yes, I hadn't realized until uh, you said it's a thousand page um, document, uh, but um, uh, it, it, in some ways uh, the word action in there maybe seems strange to some of you, but I think was very purposeful from my perspective. Uh, as I said, I kind of took on this work um, as uh, you know, kind of at the helm of the curatorial department uh, beginning about 2008. I've been at the museum for, for about four years at that point. And I think um, for myself and my colleagues in the department, um, to some extent, we're, we're really experiencing both internally uh, and um, uh, on a kind of day-to-day -day basis, uh, a lot of frustration with, uh, with some of the earlier work that had been done. And so um, you all have been inside the building and you know, seen all of the layers of uh, wallpaper that are delaminating off of the walls, all of the pieces of paint that are falling off. And so, uh, for example, as part of the kind of regular conservation monitoring that we do, myself and my colleagues in the curatorial department, you kind of emerge from those exercises, right, with a, with a kind of list, an extensive list of possible treatments that could be, um, that could be undertaken. We could bring in architectural conservators and, and, and a variety of other uh, experts to address all of those things. But how do we think about prioritizing, particularly given all of these uh, these kind of underlying issues and questions there, and so uh, it was really interesting in, in interested, excuse me, in bringing together um, this group of experts, many of whom we have worked with for many years, and others who, uh, in some ways, this was their first encounter with the museum, and kind of thinking through how do we um, how do we think about uh, what's uh, what's a priority over other other uh, um, 
parts of the historic fabric of the building, and how do we kind of think about that process and really sort of inform that decision making in a way I think that's actionable, um, because as I'm suggesting, a lot of inertia had been kind of um, had inserted itself to the process. The other sort of impetus for me was that, um, uh, as Gabrielle noted, 70% of our uh, income, the kind of earned revenue that we operate on, comes from um, ticket sales and museum shop sales. So there's a, a continual um, uh, certain desire to both, of course, increase uh, visitor numbers, uh, to, uh, to not um, you know, lessen tours, uh, to, um, um, you know, uh, to, to, to continue that, uh, that machine. Um, uh, so to speak, in, in, in terms of bringing um, earned income and revenue to support the work of the museum, uh, of course, the educational mission uh, being paramount. And so I think internally for me, as somebody who wanted to argue for undertaking this treatment or that treatment, uh, it was really kind of appealing to bring in a, a committee of experts to really sort of think through and, and I think uh, speak in some ways to museum leadership, including the board of trustees, that these were uh, important priorities for us, uh, for us to undertake. Um, and I think as part of that, that process, you know, I, I, again, I had a really sort of practical goal. That's why the word action is, is really important there for me. Uh, but um, it allowed us, I think, in an important way to revisit um, and interrogate all of these kinds of uh, questions about whether or not we were striking the right balance in terms of visitor access. Uh, and preservation, what should be preserved over other things, and how you prioritize all of these things. Uh, and so, in, in some ways, I think, uh, turned into a project um, that uh, is of um, lasting practical value to the museum, uh, but really is something that has, I think, taught us a lesson that this is something that we need to do, um, you know, perhaps not every five years or so, right? The first conservation management plan that Gabby mentioned uh, was not that old when we began this particular project, uh, but perhaps every decade or so, uh, that these, all of these questions, all of these um, underlying sort of philosophies and ideas should be uh, reopened, uh, evaluated, interrogated uh, internally and with a variety of different kinds of uh, experts. So uh, I wanted to kind of to speak to that uh, uh, there as well. So, um, you know, was struck, I think, um, uh, listening to it and of course reading uh, Gabby's paper um, by all of the, as she says, multiplicity of voices and all of the kind of different perspectives uh, that are present um, in, in kind of thinking about what's important uh, in 97 Orchard Street, what's the meaning of different parts of the historic fabric, what should be preserved, uh, what's the core uh, mission of the museum and, and what serves in, in, in um, response to one uh, or the other aspect. And so for me, you know, one thing that was missing, and I know we tried to sort of do some of this, is what, what is the, uh, the museum visitors? perspective on that. And I think you know, my, uh, it was difficult for us to, to gain access to some of them. We've sort of reached out to some and, and, and weren't successful. But anecdotally, having spoken with museum visitors in the over 12 years that I've been with the museum, really echoes, I think, a lot of the, um, uh, the perspectives that uh, both staff, um, current staff, uh, former staff, members of the preservation uh, committee, uh, really in terms of what, what's important. Uh, and what is the, um, you know, the, the, the most important um, kind of work of the, of the institution. I'll give you kind of an example. The museum convened a, um, these folks are not, are, are not um, kind of core visitors, I should say, but are folks who have visited the museum and, and have some, com some degree of expertise and were invited to kind of speak to the board from some of their, uh, their, their perspectives in that, that regard. Uh, one of these gentlemen were an architect, uh, another one was a, uh, an architectural conservator, and again, I think these folks sort of echo what we hear from visitors. You know, one of them says, well, what you should do, because this is all really so expensive um, to undertake this ongoing kind of preservation uh, of, the, of the interior historic fabric, that you should really just restore all of the apartments uh, to various moments in time, because it's the restored spaces depicting different moments in time in the life of the building. Uh, and in the life of the former residents and the actual sort of personal family and human stories that are told there that are really what is the, the kind of the powerful uh, and impactful part of what you do. Uh, and so of course somebody else raises their hand and, and said, but no, uh, it's in those unrestored, uh, stabilized ruin spaces that I feel uh, the most uh, sort of impact the quote unquote ghosts of the past, if you will. Uh, and, um, and so for me, right, that, that in some ways is, is uh, the way that we think about the visitor experience that all of these spaces within the, the building are important because uh, visitors come um, bringing uh, 
course, their own uh, experiences, uh, their own learning styles, uh, their own ways of engaging with the past, of engaging with a historic structure, or their own ideas about sense of place. And so, um, you know, in some ways, we kind of really need all of these different kinds of spaces. It really is a kind of, I think, a useful toolkit um, for us you know, as a kind of educational institution um, to be able to have this multiplicity of, of different kinds of space uh, to tell, I think, a, a nuanced and, and robust story. Uh, and so, um, you know, I think in some ways that's uh, that uh, uh, the missing, perhaps, from the paper, I think, um, represents the, the way that visitors uh, experience the building and think about the various spaces as well. Um, I love this idea about thinking uh, through what authenticity means at 97 Orchard Street. Uh, and I think for me, you know, uh, as, a, as a kind of practitioner, um, you know, taking a kind of step back from these broader sort of philosophical ideas about that uh, authenticity, of course, uh, being a construct in, in a variety of ways, and as Gabby suggested, we take great pains to be um, transparent uh, about all the kinds of decision making that takes place, even when we've gotten something quote unquote wrong, or how we're operating in, in, the, um, in the face of uh, uh, imperfect knowledge. Uh, as was with the case with the wallpaper in the Gumbert's apartment. And uh, again, what does that kind of mean on a, on a, on a daily basis? And, and because as I'm, I'm sure you've uh, kind of gotten the idea, um, it's no uh, mistake that this kind of idea of, uh, of encouraging empathy on the part of our visitors, that there's a, a kind of an emotional aspect to what we do, that this, this sort of idea of being authentic, uh, whether that's in um, preserving various parts of the original historic fabric of the building, uh, or in restoring what it might look like in a particular moment in time, uh, that we're really trying to make visitors um, sort of feel what it might have been like uh, to kind of live in that building, uh, to experience the kinds of things that the former residents, in some cases their immigrant forebears, uh, might have experienced there. Uh, and from there, right, um, uh, is, is, is really sort of, I think, where, um, uh, where the, the, the biggest kind of um, takeaways, uh, if you will, for our visitors uh, emerge. Uh, one of the other things I think I'm, I'm kind of continually struck by uh, in conversations like this, uh, with other museum professionals, uh, with uh, with students, and, and so on, uh, is you know how how does this kind of work compare with uh, whether it's other historic house museums, uh, other museums, other um, you know cultural organizations <coughs> of a kind of similar event? And I think um, you know one thing uh, perhaps you know, the the quotes from Ruth Abram to some extent I think capture some of this. Uh, you know one of the reasons why we're um, continually sort of able I think to. Um, reevaluate where we are to interrogate these kinds of um, deep questions uh, about what gets preserved and, and for what reason, uh, and a host of other things that we do um, at, the, at the museum really stems from the fact that not only we're kind of a young institution, uh, but this is a, a, a museum uh, that began um, as an idea, right? Uh, unlike a lot of other museums or uh, even historic houses, which begin as a kind of uh, obviously a building in the case of a historic house museum or a collection of objects or art or, or what have you. Uh, this museum began as an institution uh, that was an idea before any of those things uh, were in the possession uh, of the founders uh, of the museum or, or um, uh, were part of the, the work that we do. So uh, really, in some ways, kind of um, uh, always were believed to kind of be in service of that, of that overarching idea, the mission of the museum, uh, and so on. Um, and to kind of sort of, I think, close, um, you know, I think, interestingly, right, uh, I spend a lot of my time thinking about, okay, um, how do we actually make sure some of this work happens, right? Because I think in some respect, uh, both within the Tenement Museum, uh, within the kind of philanthropic community that we, uh, of course, reach out to, to to fundraise for some of these uh, projects, you know, I mean, to give you a sense of right, that ceiling, uh, just to give you a sense of what some of the things cost, that ceiling conservation, project that Gabby featured in, in uh, several of her slides, um, to conserve the ceiling of a single 325 square foot apartment uh, cost the museum nearly $100,000, right? Uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's quite expensive, um, but uh, I think uh, I would argue worthwhile for, for a variety of reasons. Um, but, um, you know, I interestingly, it's, it's um, uh, both internally and I think, uh, again, in the philanthropic community, in an interesting way, a lot of this is, is viewed as maintenance, 
it's very difficult for us to, to kind of fundraise for. Um, uh, but I, I've sort of begun to argue that this, in fact, is not is not maintenance, right? This is um, our way of adapting this historic structure, uh, which was never intended, perhaps to still even be here. Um, uh, certainly not to be a museum. Certainly not to see a thousand plus people a day. Uh, you know, nearing about a quarter of a million people uh, annually. Uh, adapting this historic building to um, to withstand the impact of ever increasing numbers of visitors. Uh, I think you've gotten the idea that it's, it's important to us, we feel it's integral uh, to the visitor experience that you get to stand inside the spaces uh, that the immigrant residents of the building, the former immigrant residents of the building, uh, once called home. Uh, and that these are, um, uh, this is a kind of a broader sort of way of thinking about some of this work, not as ongoing maintenance, uh, but as a way of, for us to kind of um, to continue to serve uh, the mission of the museum to continue to serve uh, that really sort of important founding idea and, um, and, and to, to make sure that uh, I think in addition to that that the successors, uh, successor leadership of the museum has, has options uh, in terms of what they would uh, be able to do uh, in, in, in the future. Thanks. So now we'll move to the uh, <clears throat> second part of the program, to the conversation. And I think we should begin by allowing the right of response to uh, speak up. Thank you. Um, it's so great to be here talking about all this because we've had many private conversations and I've just been privy to the group conversations, but, but to make it a more official dialogue is actually very satisfying. Um, so the thing I'd, I'd comment um, in response to really is about the visitor, the visitor impressions of a visitor perspective. And that is something actually from the start of this project that I wanted to prioritize. Um, at the beginning, I thought it would really be founded more on the neighborhood perspectives and the visitor perspectives than um, those of the museum staff and, and conservators. My interest coming from folklore was sort of grounded in getting the everyday um, experiences and impressions of the space exposed, since those are maybe less readily available. Uh, so that you know, it's in, I feel that this is still an open piece of this project. It it seemed a little bit too unwieldy at the time to try and address both what was going on in the Preservation Action Committee and the staff um, and the public. Although I did have, um, we did try to to track down some committed visitors and members of the museum as available participants, and I, I did interview three of them, and I. You know, I really thought a lot about those conversations. They were several hours long, and I, I wrote down a lot from our, our you know, the audio tape. But, um, but it wasn't representative enough to really include somehow. Um, they seemed very particular, these you know, experiences. So to, to include that in the future, I think, would be a really valuable piece of it. Um, I also didn't include in this, there, there are lots of voices that didn't actually come out tonight. But one of the representatives that I, th I think was really meaningful was my meeting with um, the housekeepers in the museum. The women, I don't know how many actually women are now working. Probably half a dozen. Half a dozen women who, mm -hmm. you know, wake up four in the morning, 4.30 in the morning, and they're the ones to open the museum every day. And they arrange it and clean it up from yesterday's tours. So um, they have this experience. I sat down with a few of these women, and it was really, very powerful narratives about what it's like to be in the museum in the morning, um, at five in the morning alone when nobody else is there, and to be in these spaces that for several of them were very evocative of the childhoods they had actually, um, one woman from uh, the Dominican Republic and one from Puerto Rico, and they both sort of um, found very close parallels in the stories that were narrated, one being a, the wake for a baby and another um, just thinking about the dresses that were on display in a room and how that reminded her of her adolescence. And so there was, there was some very meaningful connections in this conversation of memory and, and kind of time, time transport from that population that interacts specifically between the staff and the conservation specialists. Um, so that is, there, there are definitely other voices 
that didn't, didn't get heard tonight that should, but I would, yeah, I think it would help to fill it out. So I, I had a couple of points which I really put out here um, largely for all the museum professionals in the audience to think about because I was struck, um, first of all, point one was Ruth Abrams' insistence that the story is more important than the material. And how, I mean, that plays one way with all the interesting ramifications that, uh, that God be brought out today. It plays one way in a museum like the Tenet Museum, but how would it play in a history museum or an art museum or a natural history ethnographic museum? I imagine that there's a spectrum, and I'd be curious to know how people who have thought a lot about this from their perspectives would feel about it. And then um, I'm wondering how, how the museum professionals um, would feel about themselves working with a folklorist, <laughs> paying attention to the various decisions that they make working on a painting or a piece of furniture or a textile. How does having a folklorist doing what Gabi did with a building as an artifact, how would that affect the practice of a conservator or a curator, or the knowledge, the kinds of questions that a conservator or a curator might be thinking about, mm -hmm. which they might not be thinking about now. So I just throw those out to the audience uh, for comment. Okay, well, <laughs> I guess I, I'm somewhat puzzled that your distinction between museum professionals and folklorists, because I consider myself a museum professional and I am a folklorist. Um, but I do understand that what you're probably hoping to understand is how our training as folklorists might influence the decisions that we make as curators, educators, and collections managers in a museum setting. Sure, and do you want to identify yourself? Oh, I'm sorry. My name's Nancy Solomon. I'm the director of Long Island Traditions. And I'm, I'm currently working on three exhibits right now. And I'm constantly wrestling with how, what story are we going to tell, what objects, photographs, graphic materials are we going to use, tell various um, you know, stories and, and what kind of experience are we going to give to the exhibit visitor um, through that. And I'm guessing that you know, the Ten Museum, you know, I kept thinking to myself, what story are you going to tell? And how exactly are you going to tell it? Are you going to tell it through words? Are you going to tell it through graphic materials, through objects? Are you going to tell it through the voices? of the interviews of the people that you've collected all these years. And that's a very hard decision to make, especially when you've got, you know, very different approaches, you know, from historians, anthropologists, folklorists, and, and, uh, and I don't know, collections or object-oriented professions, you know, in, in these kinds of debates. I guess what I try and do is to include as many voices as is reasonable, but also one that will be engaging to that visitor. And sometimes it's always a work in progress, but especially these days where you have all this technology, it's a lot easier to, do, to tell multiple stories, even within one room. Well, David, let me ask you, I mean, would you now <clears throat> seek to have a folklorist as part of your team to, to open up the kinds of perspectives that, that Gavi has done? Um, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I wouldn't necessarily say it needed to be a, a folklorist mm -hmm. per se, but I think um, it was helpful for me, as I said, both to have somebody that was kind of documenting the process in the kind of ethnographic sense, right? Um, uh, so there was a, a record of these these conversations, so to speak. But I think, um, uh, yes, in, in the sense that I think it, it really pushed uh, both me as the kind of director of the project uh, and I think the committee, sort of just having you uh, there and kind of asking particular questions that really, um, you know, not only um, sort of made us think about what were some of the kind of underlying uh, philosophies and, and, and kind of broader, 
uh, overarching issues that that were sort of informing, um, you know, kind of very in some ways practical decisions. Um, but uh, but really, I think it enhanced. I think some of that. So yeah, I, I think. Um, it, it, um, in some ways, it was a little bit of serendipity, right? <laughs> that these two, these two sort of uh, terrific uh, projects, the cultures of conversation here, and this I'm a less funded kind of study coincided. But I think it's something that we had the opportunity to to do again. Um, you know, I, I very much uh, want to do that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mark, did you have a question? Uh, well, I was just saying, uh, one of the things that this made me think of is, and I may actually bungle the reference here, but is it is it Lasco that they just um, completely duplicated, right? So, uh, you know, the, the Paleolithic cave in France where they shut it down and they built a brand new right. one right next to it that looked exactly like it. And, you know, and obviously that was pressed by this, you know, pressing conservation issue that the, you know, the humidity and the breath was causing everything to rot. But they had obviously made some assessment that the visitor experience was the main thing. I mean, you know, obviously with such a, uh, pressing conservation thing, they had no choice if they, you know, it was either that or shut it down completely. But I was so interested to hear your, you know, your kind of constant tension and battling between what do we have here? Do we have an artifact that's in need of preservation or do we have a visitor experience that's in need of promoting? And, and I kind of come from a reconstructionist background and I actually like countries like Iran where they like fix stuff all up again because you you know you you lose something by not reconstructing things you, you know you go and see all these carefully conserved ancient monuments and you have no idea what they felt like but you go to what is it Persepolis that they've just you know built it all back up and they probably built it wrong and there's all kinds of problems but but I wonder you know and when you when you talk about on the one hand, going to the thrift store and finding a mirror that you buy for 30 bu bucks and put it on the wall, and on the other hand, spending $100,000 to like preserve the plaster on this ceiling, that seems totally crazy to me. I mean, that just seems like, you know, which is it? Um, and, you know, and, and so I'm just curious what your, you know, what your perspective on the, you know, the, I mean, you know, it makes me wonder whether you, have sat down and said, what is it that our visitors are actually getting? You know, what do they want and what are they getting? And what piece of what it is is giving it to them? You know, and I suspect they're getting more from that $30 thrift store mirror than they are from the $100,000 ceiling. And so, what does that mean? Well, I would just say from the few visitor conversations I had, the in-depth visitor conversations, um, there was, across those conversations, always kind of a, a uniform desire to keep the, the building authentic. You know, people always don't, they don't like the idea of recreating everything. If you push, if you set up the extremes, you know, could you redo it all in like mm -hmm. Luther Abram's perspective and still have the same effect? They don't like that. That's not appealing to most people I spoke with. However, um, if you ask them, you know, the, people, the, the few folks I asked, um, you know, what do you really, what speaks to you in this space or what resonates with you in what way, there, there are frequently the same um, similar responses, uh, certain features of the front hallway, mm -hmm. the rondelle and the, the portrait on the wall or the banister. Um, and, but this is informed also by the, the tours they're on, you know, the stories the, of the history right. of the material that they get, they learn about from the educators really allows them to connect with that material's history as well. So well, also you're probably guiding them to decide what they like and what's important Yes, those to are very them. Yeah. certainly pointed on And in fact, I wonder whether your thousand page report is not also part of that process, right? Mm -hmm. That, you know, this, we take conservation extremely seriously mm -hmm. here. Um, oh, I just out of curiosity, what is the cost of the Im immediate short-term and long-term recommendations? Uh -huh. uh, about two million, two million dollars. Yeah, and I mean it really is everything from uh, structural repairs to mitigate yeah. some of those vibrations, right? That yeah. you mentioned uh, to you know exterior masonry uh, repairs, which are about obviously keeping water out and those kinds of things. But I mean to sort of react to uh, to your comment, your question. I mean I don't I think uh, both personally and I think as an institution we don't necessarily it as a zero sum kind of right. thing, right? It's a, it's a we can do both, and I think it's important. That we do both. That um, you know, some visitors find uh, the kind of um, uh, the immersive, recreated, or restored historical setting depicting what 
this apartment looked like in 1900 to be the most powerful part of their experience and some of the, you know, the, the kind of um, soiled, decades worth of soiled, uh, you know, kind of wallpaper on the roundel uh, painting that you were just mentioning is the kind of most important. Right, but do you think some visitors find the $100,000 restoration of the plaster ceiling the most important thing? Oh, well, then they'll never know. <laughs> they cost $100,000. <laughs> Um, you know, I think, uh, uh, but an essential part, right, of what that particular space, right, if you, if you loot, if you're just looking at, you know, lath with all of the plaster removed, you're essentially removed all of the kind of layers, right, the mm -hmm. physical layers of history to some extent that I think are there. We'll often talk about kind of the, um, in a metaphorical sense, right, those are representative of, of the, right? yeah, uh, right. I have, let's see, Laurel, Deborah. Aaron, did you have a question? Yeah. So, Laurel, do you want to start? Okay, this is Curator Envy, as a curator from the American Museum of Natural History. And one thing that struck me about Tenement Museum that didn't seem to come through in the talk is how much the heavily docented touring mm -hmm. enables both, on the one hand, the bringing forward of the story without a lot of flashing screens, talking heads, labels, uh, which is what most of us are stuck with in large public museums. And on the other hand, allowing people to touch without, you know, rampaging destruction because people, the tours are so small and so mm -hmm. controlled. And um, I guess I am struck with envy because the kind of ethnographic collection I curate, um, when it was collected, the stories were collective stories. The X or the Y do this. And what you're co collecting is wrapped in intimate stories, which is what people respond to. And for us, it's an uphill schlep to try and get them. We get them with the recent stuff. But it, with the old, it, it's only fortuitous moments. So no, I think what you're doing is really interesting. I also wish it were a more translatable, transferable model to institutions like my own than I think it could ever possibly be. Deborah? Yeah, I mean, I just wonder this tension between the visitors and is there a certain point where you're going to say, okay, we're going to limit the number of them? I mean, I know you do because they have to come on tours and all that, but to limit them further, to make them wear booties the way they do in a lot of European house museums, to kind of control somehow the amount of damage because, I mean, clearly that sounds crazy to have, you know, a thousand people. And there's demand, which is great, but the demand can also be controlled. You can charge more money. Right. You know, there's ways to deal right. with that issue right. to, to preserve the building. So, you know, maybe spending $100,000 on on restoration isn't the right attitude. I, you know, I'm just throwing that out there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, another, and I, and I have a second question that, again, that is about what, you know, why aren't there more tenement museums in the world? Mm -hmm. You know, look, <laughs> this is a really unique situation in New York, but on the other hand, you could have a tenement museum in Baltimore, and you could have one in Detroit, you could have one in San Francisco. There's any number of American cities where the same story could be told mm -hmm. in, a, in terms of artifact, and, and why hasn't it caught on if it's such a popular thing in New York, and, you know, this could be, like, branded. <laughs> there's, like, there's Disneyland, there's Disney World, right, right. there's Euro Disney. <laughs> not, to, not to push that, but... Right, right. Well, I mean, I don't have an answer to your second question. It's a good one, right? And I can say that, you know, there have been all sorts of ideas, including kind of a mobile tenement on a truck that have been floated over the years right, within the institution. Um, but, uh, you know, thankfully, I think that one didn't, didn't really come to, um, to any material fruition. But I think, I mean, the other, you know, uh, the, the, the booties thing, right, reminds me of, um, I mean, that was a conversation we had as part of the, uh, the creation of this project. And I think what's important, um, uh, you know, it very well may be that a future leadership of the museum decides that, um, that the balance between visitor access, that the kind of interpretive educational program um, is uh, having too deleterious an impact on the historic fabric that they need to, to sort of move in, in a different direction. Um, and I think uh, really, the, for me, the kind of the lesson of this whole uh, project, both uh, working on this and of course working with Gabby, was that th this, is, this is something that we need to do periodically, that this is a continual process of evaluating where we are, 
Um, it may be that, you know, where we are as a kind of young institution, right, we're only about 30 years old, um, you know, we don't, we don't, for example, have a, an endowment, a large endowment like a lot of other uh, museums or cultural institutions. So uh, it's incredibly important that we continue to see the number of visitors that we do so we can, um, you know, re remain um, uh, <coughs> achieving the mission, hopefully, that we... Um, so, so could you envision just the, the, the visitorship destroying the Tenby Museum and then just making another one next door <laughs> in a fresh building? Uh, personally, no. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I sort of, you know, I think, I, I think, um, you know, Ruth Abrams' comments are interesting, um, and I think she, to some extent, is really sort of uh, overstating the case to make a particular point. Um, I think if, if pressed, she would probably uh, qualify, qualify that as most of us uh, do, because she was involved in the decision making that's gotten us to where we, uh, to where we are. So I think. Um, you know, it may be that, you know, we don't necessarily want to preserve every single piece of historic fabric, even though, you know, I have to say uh, all of the, uh, you call them docents, we refer to them as uh, as educators, right? They're sort of incredibly fastidious. You know, I get probably at least two calls a day about a tiny flake of paint, you know, smaller than this water bottle cap that's fallen off of the wall. We're never going to be able to save everything, obviously, right? Um, but, uh, you know, I think, um, uh, Perhaps that's what Ruth was speaking to, but I think you know again if, if pressed, um, you know a lot of the staff would would say that uh, telling the stories that we tell uh, and doing so in a space that has a kind of sense of place uh, is is important and and is essential to the kind of impact that we have. And in that sense, there was there were also um, two brief conversations I had with other staff members where um, the and again they didn't weren't represented here, but they referenced the space of the parlor as, as what they would, you know, if forced to choose kind of a space to preserve or something to, to keep authentic. Um, it would be that space. Um, and there was no specific material uh, element that, that called to them for that reason, but the social experience that that, that story tells uh, was significant. So in light of thinking about how to preserve these spaces versus these structures, that could really also change the conversation. I have Aaron, Heather, or Catherine. Yeah, I don't have as much of a question as a kind of couple half formulated responses um, to long, the wonderful presentations. The first had to do with, as, as you were talking, Gabby, especially, um, I kept thinking back to your title, The Multiplicity of Voices, which is such, it's kind of the kind of the, the standard trope for perspectives, mm -hmm. but also the, the, the sort of emphasis on narrative and storytelling. But, but your, what came out for me so strongly in your presentation was a, was a kind of different trope of touch mm -hmm. and the kind of indexicality uh, of not only being able to put your hand on the banister that so many generations of people have touched <coughs> and the kind of privileging of being in a museum <coughs> space where you can have that particular experience. Um, but then also by, by the end of your talk, your, your sort of focus on affect and the sort of other semantic association of you know touch touching mm -hmm. of touch as being about a kind of emotional mm -hmm. um, connection as well as necessarily a physical one. I just I wonder about the the balance between mm -hmm. touch and voice as a sort of operative way for how we understand mm -hmm. maybe all museums, but especially one like this where the relationship with the things in the environment, the, the objects, but the, the building itself, um, is sort of differently configured. And then that made me think, and also this last kind of couple rounds of comments, about one of the things that I love about this place and this presentation brings out is that it really pushes us to think of what a museum is as an institution, um, and uh, especially one that's not primarily a custodian of a collection but that something else, and um, not only in the sense of, you know, are the people who guide the experience educators, are they curators, what kind of vocab, how much of the museological vocabulary is appropriate, relevant, useful, obsolete, um, 
obviously, you know, it speaks to questions about authenticity and what needs to be preserved in order to maintain the site as an effective tool for giving people a certain kind of experience. And maybe part of the problem is the semantic baggage of the term museum, which brings with it all of these associated practices and legacies and bureaucracies that um, maybe aren't important as much as it also brings a certain emphasis on the value of history. And um, I just wonder how much it, it over-determines the conversation about preservation. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd say that's a really, it's a really interesting point between the, the voices and the touch. The voices, um, in my mind going into this, it really referred to first my my choice to align myself with a certain trend in vernacular architecture and folklore, which is really privileging multiple, very multiple perspectives around a single um, object or engagement with a single thing or tradition. Um, so for me, it spoke to my own personal methodology, and then also the fact of this moment in the in the museum's life where they brought together all these committee members that for a short period of time that came up frequently in the in the or several times in the last few meetings from the committee members you know from the arch historic architecture preservationists and the conservators reflecting on what did the last you know what did this whole convening do for us and unanimously I think all times they they all felt that it was so useful and so constructive to be meeting with professionals in other fields all working on the same site um, and exchange and talk and, and learn perspectives on the same material so so that uh, appreciation for the multivocal process also came from the methodology in the museum to doing that um, and I just wanted to note also about the museum terminology. I think it's a really good point as well. And it came up, this isn't related so much to the Tenement Museum, but speaking with Ruth Abram, she uh, had she was just beginning her new project in upstate New York, Behold New Lebanon, which you may or may not have heard of, but um, it's been up and running for a couple summers now. And she's intentionally, she created it, um, kind of this public project uh, around the rural American life in this town that she had, she had moved to not long ago. And it's economically uh, depleted, and so she's doing this partly for, for economic development and regrowth and tur tourism, but also devoted to exposing and sharing these narratives of rural life that, that seem to her very neglected in the larger uh, story here. So she instantly called that a museum, a living, an outdoor, the America's first outdoor rural museum or living museum, something like that. It's it's just members of the town, residents, who are participating in this program. There's no, you know, institution there, anything physical space. So um, it would be really interesting to think about her use of the word museum in the project she does. I think you know she's explicit about her activist and political missions and aligning herself with the museum institution. So. How she factors into that conversation in this case, I think, is really critical. Hmm. Okay. Oh, Heather, sorry. Um, I um, it's the um, evocation of the banister and the sort of touching of the real thing um, is exactly the experience that I had in my visits to the museum. But this, um, you know, makes me think of the parallel with with rare books and facsimiles. You know, there's this kind of desire to work with the real material, which depending on what that is, is, is um, deteriorating and it, and it compromises its integrity to have everybody touching it so people make these facsimiles, digital or otherwise, to use like Let's Go, be another example. Um, and in thinking of the kind of spectrum of ways to approach that that we're talking about um, and this preservation plan, is there, is it kind of, is it a um, sort of uh, an approach sort of through the whole building where you, I guess what I'm trying to say is, you know, you could um, have some parts of the building, I mean, when I was there with my daughter, we could only visit one apartment, you know, so that there's, you know, so many different pieces of this. It's one building, but it's so many different stories, and you have everything from, 
um, variations on what's authentic and not authentic to places that haven't been renovated at all. And, and so, um, it, it, I mean, that's, you know, when you talk about these kinds of preservation decisions, they're made, I suppose, in um, relationship to each specific space. Is that, I, that wasn't clear to me. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely the case, and I think um, uh, we certainly prioritize spaces that are, for example, part of the regular kind of tour program um, over spaces that, that perhaps are not. An example would be that the, the fifth floor of the building remains completely unused, and so, you know, we've really, um, up to this point in time, really invested very few resources in, in terms of kind of um, you know, stabilizing, uh, deteriorating historic fabric and, and, and so on. So, I mean, um, part of that is I think that, uh, you know, some of the funding for this, you know, funders want to see, um, you know, they have certain parameters, right? You know, they want their, uh, their, um, uh, their, their, uh, their funds to, to, to have an impact on, on the visiting public. Uh, and so, you know, that, that sometimes distracts some of that. Um, but I think um, for us, Yes, there's it's a, you know absolutely the the spaces that that people see on a regular basis are um, are prioritized over those that are not. My question was about endowment, which is a word that did come up. Yeah. Um, because it seems to me the the you, I mean, essentially in some ways you need an endowment for the ephemeral, and how how are you is this document going to help you get an endowment? I mean, can is that if you have a more substantial endowment, how would that impact on how you envision the future of the institution? Um, <laughs> yes, we very much like it. <laughs> uh, yeah, and, and I think it is, you know, it's part of the, the museum, for example, has recently uh, undertaken, and, and I, I believe is about three quarters of the way to completing a $20, $20 million capital campaign. Um, part of that is, uh, you know, two million dollars that go to this. Um, you know, again, we're a relatively young institution, a lot, uh, with the exception of the 97 uh, Orchard Street building and how, how recently you guys have been uh, down to the museum, but we have a uh, building that now houses our visitor center and, and museum shop. Uh, some office space is going to be there. We have a new exhibit there. Um, this is a building that the museum has only recently purchased, so we, we carry a mortgage, right? Uh, and so well, part of this capital campaign, to some extent, is about paying down um, some of the debt that the institution has, and I think um, it's in the, the sort of the strategic plan to, uh, to, establish, to establish an endowment. And I mean, for me, it's interesting to kind of think about, as, as you're suggesting, what, how does that change some of these, these kinds of decisions that, uh, that get me? Because so much of the, the emphasis is on both, you know, I think certainly from a, um, from a mission perspective, uh, but also from a, a kind of a financial perspective, right? We need to see the number of people we see um, on, a, uh, on a daily uh, and annual basis to, um, to continue to do what we do. Which is destroying the building. Which is? Which, which is destroying the building, right? With, the visitorship is destroying right, the building. Right, but I think you, to, to a certain extent, yeah. to a certain yeah. extent, and I think um, from, from day one, the institution has kind of accepted yeah. uh, a, a certain degree of that, but I think, uh, you know, what I hope uh, you know, uh, comes across in, in, in Gabby's um, talk and, and some of what I've said is that it really the, our, our primary goal in that sense is to, to try to strike the, the right balance. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, Andrew? Yeah, I just was curious if you, you um, I remember from doing, uh, from Gabby's class that you talked, we talked a little bit about the post-1935 yeah, kind yeah. of interpretation efforts, and I know that you just mentioned the new building. Mm -hmm. If you could talk a little bit about that, because the, because clearly putting kind of like an, an, uh, an exhibition together and, and kind of the interpretation involved in in telling the story of immigration post-1935 is a very different thing than walking through a historic structure. Um, and so I've kind of been curious to see what, how, that, how that new building will evolve and, and what your kinds of goals and aims are. Will, it be, will they be led tours or how, people, how are people going to interact? 
with the uh, space. Yeah, and so and so, so what you're you're talking about for 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 those that don't know, this is an exhibit that'll uh, scheduled to open next year. Uh, it's in the building that now houses the museum's visitor center that I really just referred to. Um, and unlike 97 Orchard Street, that building uh, wasn't condemned essentially in 1935. Um, and so we're going to be telling the stories of uh, several immigrant families who inhabited that building uh, in the kind of the post World War II um, era. But yeah, I mean, in, in some respect, we're we're continuing to kind of hew to the same model. It's it's um, you know uh, guided tours in um, a combination of as found and, and restored um, spaces. Obviously, they look. A, Different and the kind of the to some extent the kind of thematic content is, is different. I think what's um, you know kind of a, a fundamental level different is that um, you know we're working in a different way with with people who um, live these stories not very long ago, um, and so you know they in, in some respect have been um, partners, right? They, they we've been we've been really I think. Um, uh, careful to be sure that they have a voice in, in how their story gets told. Uh, but overall, right, it's, it's the same kind of uh, interpretive model. I mean, what's a little bit different about this new building uh, is that the exhibit itself will occupy the third floor. As I said, the uh, visitor center and shops on the kind of bottom level and we'll have some additional office space on uh, some of the upper floors. So in some ways, it's kind of like a multi-use building. And whereas, you know, we're able to sort of um, I hesitate to use the kind of phrase get around, but it kind of captures, I think, what I'm trying to say. We um, uh, we can get around a lot of the kind of building codes in New York at 97 Orchard Street, right? Because it's not a home, it's not a workplace, so to speak, right? Um, but uh, this building is a little bit uh, a little bit different. So the, 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 the way we achieve kind of, I think, um, bringing that third floor of the building kind of online, so to speak, as an exhibit is a little bit, a little bit different. Since that was a relatively quick Answer here, David. If one's related to Andrew's question, which you know, Gabby, you raised with both the house cleaners, um, housekeepers, as well as the idea of neighborhood, and, and also David, in talking about you know, also working in a neighborhood, exhibiting a neighborhood that's dramatically changing, that is no longer, in many cases, a tenement neighborhood, but trying to recreate the experience. Because I guess I noticed in some of my visits that the visitors, many of them, those who spoke up, really clung to, and that's a somewhat unfair, to, they, they expressed a feeling of a golden age, uh, sort of Euro-American golden age around the turn of the century, and really didn't acknowledge that there was some pushback by the interpreters. Oh, but you know, there are other people who lived, you know, post-35, uh, you know, Latin American immigrants in particular, and that this is part of a fabric but now you can no longer go out the front door and you know you see hotels and boutique hotels and other and it's not visible though it's right. there and then I'm just sort of wondering how without I guess you'll try to deal with that to some extent in this <coughs> new building but this seems like you know trying to broaden into a, a neighborhood which does open up some great possibilities different from just a single building which, for all intents and purposes, history ended uh, in thirty in the thirties. I mean, I think what, you know what you're suggesting is the kind of the. the, the <coughs> I'm, I'm thinking back. I mean, it wasn't terribly long ago, but I started the museum in 2004, and you know, there there was much more. You would you might think of them as kind of uh, quote unquote sort of tools in which to at least gesture to the idea that this was still a uh, neighborhood that uh, was home to to newcomers, maybe from China or something of that nature. You know, sometimes that was as um, not very sort of deep or nuanced necessarily, yeah. but at least you could point out the window to a Chinese sign on a shop, but but but. I, that's that's diminished uh, over over the years, and so yeah, I mean, I think in terms of um, you know really kind of prioritizing this new exhibit over some things that uh, under a previous museum leadership, you, you all may uh, not know that Ruth Abram uh, retired uh, as the founder and president of the museum in, in 2008. That that I think um, you know a new leadership of the museum really kind of prioritized this new exhibit. I think in part uh, because of the reason that um, uh, that that, that you brought forward. And I had a, a really good conversation with the new, I think the position was created anew, Emily Gallagher, mm -hmm. Director of Outreach, um, hand in hand with this new mm -hmm. project at 103. So really trying to work um, explicitly as a priority with right. different communities, um, oral history workshops and, and bilingual um, 
you know, translators and, and, and hearing people's voices who are who still uh, have family from these spaces. But um, but she highlighted a lot of these really important tensions, like in in the surrounding neighborhood, Lower East Side. She does a lot of work. It sounds like to um, to draw in local residents to the museum. And why aren't more of the local residents who have been there for a long time coming? And part of it is the cost might be prohibitive, um, and that's a big thing. And so there's all kinds of programming that the museum has developed to try and offer you know, discount or free opportunities for local neighbors, um, programs like that. But she also, she talked about in general, you know, working with these immigrant communities that are now in other boroughs, and how are you connecting them? Um, she's going out to these other you know, Queens and Brooklyn or wherever else to hold sessions to really try and think through uh, the interpretation of the space and their history there. But having them be out there isn't irrelevant to what's happening, you know, to the interpretation and what, what people learn about on Orchard Street. So it sounds as though she's dealing with all of that very thoughtfully. Thank you very much to our panelists, to the audience. Feel free to continue the conversation.